of feedback up here, Steve? I need a little walk-up music. Somebody says, dun, 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 dun. Hallelujah. Actually, not walk-up music. It's actually transition music because we have people online and moving. There you guys go. Thank you. That's why that's there. Hallelujah. Well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Good to see some of you. Some of you I haven't seen in a very long time. Very long time. Good to see you guys. Praise the Lord. Well, if you didn't know, you will know here in a minute, we are in week six of the Hebrew message called the Letter to the Hebrews. And, uh, man, we've been looking at just this entire letter, and I don't want to go too much into the background. Um, I do want to encourage you that if you haven't been watching it or if you haven't up to date on it or anything like that, man, go online and, um, and catch up on this because it's a really good series. And you'll get an understanding. I think the biggest thing that we're going to get so far is like why this letter was written and who the letter was written to. And I think that's very imperative because when we have this movement that we are a part of, the Judeo-Christian faith, um, there's a tendency to do exactly what the book of Hebrews is doing. And that's where people are going back into the traditions and the, the stuff that really... Uh, biblically is no longer there. They love the sacrifices. They love doing that stuff. And that's what's happening here in the book of Hebrews is the, the, the Hebrews, the Jewish people who had come to the faith in Messiah were, were going back. They were going back into the, the traditions uh, and to really salvation uh, by works instead of salvation by grace through faith. No other passage, I believe, really speaks to that than what we're going to talk about this morning. Um, only three verses or four verses I think we're going to cover this morning, but definitely um, it should at least rattle us a little bit because we've been looking at, like last week, we looked at the authority that Messiah Yeshua has restored, Jesus has restored. Uh, we've talked about the authority that we have that once belonged to the human, right, the human beings, and, and we, we forfeited that in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve gave up that, that authority over to Hasatan or Satan. And it's easy to forget that now with Yeshua, and we talked about that last week, right, now with Yeshua, that, that, that authority has been restored to us as followers of Christ. And I love that. But when one remembers that this letter was written to the Jewish people from a Jewish person, this really, it really goes to, be, to making more sense of what the writer is explaining to the people of Hebrews, especially when it comes to the authority. What I mean is it's easy to understand the author's intent. We get to learn the intent. And so as we're running through this, there's two perspectives you kind of have to maintain as we're talking about this letter. The first, main, the first understanding is remembering who wrote it and who it's written to, but also how does it apply the application for us today? We've got to continue. It's kind of like this, this dual parallel thing that we're kind of walking through. And so it's important. See, the Jewish people, and they still do this today, especially in the Orthodox movement, they believe all the authority belongs to them. But they don't realize that the authority has been given back through Yeshua. And you miss that. You missed the authority by his death and resurrection, and absolutely, truly his life. Restored it all to mankind that we would trust in him, that we would trust Messiah. So many miss the part of this part that we're going to talk about, and that is the part about salvation. And as we left off last week, the last thing that's going to be defeated is what? Death. death, that's right. So death is going to be defeated. It will once and for all have no power over us. Thank you, whoever said that, thank you, because it's true. Right now, we have to face death. Right now, death comes to everyone. It is appointed unto man to die and face judgment, Scripture teaches us. So with that understanding, with understanding that who Messiah is, Mashiach, and how he has restored some things to mankind, I love what the author is going to do next, which takes us into verse 10. Verse 10, right here, let's kick it right off. For it was fitting for Yahweh or for God for whom, for whom all things exist. Now, I can stop right there, and we can preach for a moment, can't we? 
we can really hone in on just that statement that the author just made. What did he say? For it was fitting for God for whom and through whom all or through whom all things what? Exist. Why do we exist? Get this for him. That should change some people's thinking and understanding of life, shouldn't it? Hallelujah. We don't exist for like us. We exist for him. Not just by him, not only did he create us, obviously, set us in place, but we, create, we, we exist through him or for him. I love that. It's powerful. But watch. Now watch this. In leading many sons to glory. This is where we're going to hang on to a lot today. For it was fitting for God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in leading many sons to glory. That tells us something, right, about Jesus? Really, remember now, this statement is so powerful because remember who we're, we're talking to. We're talking to the Jewish people. Jewish people feel like they're the only ones. But because of Messiah and because everything exists for God's purpose and through God, he's leading many sons to glory. Now, watch this. I love this. To perfect through sufferings. Now, we don't like that part. We don't like that. I mean, remember, we're talking about Jesus here, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to flip here in a minute. Through sufferings, the initiator... Of their salvation. The word initiator, in some of your translations, depending on what you're reading, can also mean captain. It can mean the captain of your salvation, the leader, the forerunner is another word. The forerunner of their salvation. In other words, everything that Messiah did behind him comes what? Let's go back. Many sons to glory. He is the firstborn of, come on, many. Firstborn of many. It's powerful. So he is the captain of their salvation. Now we kick this off with really the subject that we've been dealing with over and over and over again, right off the top about who Messiah is, who Yeshua is, and his establishment with Yahweh. Yahweh holds everything under him. It sits, everything sits under him, everything was created for him. And yet, with all of that in mind, this is what I love, with all of that understanding. He, he does something that's the greatest, the greatest plan ever devised by mankind, or for mankind, rather. From the beginning, Yahweh, through Yeshua, had a plan. And this is what this whole text is about. And that plan was to bring many sons to glory, to reestablish, knowing the fall of mankind. And he does it through suffering, the suffering of Messiah. I mean, you want to talk about hope. I mean, if we really want to look at something today, we were just singing some beautiful music and worship, and I, I couldn't help but think of the only reason we get to sing like we do is simply because of what Messiah did, the suffering that he endured so that I don't have to. See, that speaks to the, the character of Messiah, what he had to endure. I think sometimes we get our eyes off the subject matter of, like, not just that Jesus is Lord and he's our Messiah, but what he endured to bring us in. Romans 8 and 3 takes me to this word. This is interesting because really Paul summarizes this in Romans 8 and 3. Says, for what was impossible for the Torah. What was impossible? Salvation. This is dealing with salvation. I understand what I'm about to read isn't saying that the Torah is invalid. Watch what he's telling us. For what was impossible for the Torah. Why was it impossible for the Torah? Since it was weakened on the account of the flesh. So notice now something else is introduced, right? So we have the first introduction is the Torah. That's the first character that's in this. The second character that comes in is what? The flesh. Is it saying that the Torah was weak? No. It's saying, watch, it says it was weakened, how? On the account of the flesh. In other words, trying to live out Torah for salvation because of our sinful nature done all the way back like we've talked about in the Garden of Eden. And every nature born from that perspective, every person born is born with that sinful nature. And because of it, it weakens 
the Torah. In other words, the Torah can't be fulfilled in our life the way we want it to without facing death because we will face death because we'll break Torah. And we talk about this before. I've talked to several people. We think about this, right? Like which commandment has a death sentence? All of them. Some directly and some indirectly, right? But they all, all ten of the commandments that we have, all have a death sentence, which means someone had to die. Someone had to be tortured. A price had to be paid. This is what Paul is alluding to. Again, he says, since it was weakened on account of the flesh. But watch. God has done. What we could not do because of our sinful flesh, because of the flesh, God did it. This is what Hebrews is alluding to. He's saying the same thing. How? Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as a sin offering. Man, if we really meditate on this, I really believe this, guys. I believe this, is, this could be one of the most humbling passages in the entire Bible. Because when you think about what has happened, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Why sinful flesh? Think about this for a moment. This is really deep. If he came down as Yahweh, if he came down as God, fully God, that wouldn't have done any of us any good. None. He had to become fully, but he couldn't come down also. Like, think of the other, like, right? Like, what if he came down as fully man? Just fully man. We'd still have a problem because he would be of the flesh. And he wouldn't be able to do what he was able to do that we need to do. And we couldn't do. That'll tongue tie you. But he does it. Yahweh does it. He doesn't just come down as God. And he doesn't just come down as man. What does he do? He comes down fully God. Fully man. Wow. And he comes down in the likeness of sinful flesh. As a sin offering. That's powerful. He condemns sin in the flesh. He's able to demonstrate for us. He's able to communicate something for us that we could not do. None of us. You guys are great people. People online, great people, man. But I don't know any one of you, man, that that can do this without breaking Torah. Now, we try. And we're going to deal with that here in a moment. We're going to talk about why it's important that we follow Torah in light of what we know about Messiah. In light of what we know. I want us to take notice of what we've already talked about. The Torah was weak and it was weakened because of our flesh. And this has always been the battle. This is the battle that we will constantly... There's two battles going on. I've talked about the one several times. The first battle is the battle for truth. The second battle is the battle of the flesh. It's something that we wrestle with constantly. I had a talk this uh, during our Thanksgiving with one of our relatives, and we were talking about this very this very point, you know. And I get it on Sabbath. This is easy to talk about. I think it's during the week that it gets difficult. And we talked about love and how vital love is to our walk, and we'll see that here in a moment. And we were talking about, I said, no matter what the flesh feels like, no matter how I feel about a certain person, I'm not allowed, listen to me, to hate them or to be bitter towards them or be angry towards them. I don't have that right. When I put on the name of Yeshua, the name of Yahweh, I'm more my life. And I declare, right? This is like, let me go back here. This is what it really means, right? I mean, think about it. Isn't that really what it means to, 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 uh, to take the name of the Lord, the Lord's name in vain? It's not about cussing. Not about saying a bad word. Not a good habit. Not something I would recommend at home around your wife and children. You shouldn't talk that way. But that's not what we're referring to. It's, that, it's the wedding vow, isn't it? That we're coming to before the Lord and we're declaring that he is Lord and we're putting him on. We're taking his name just as a bride takes on the name of the groom. We too take on that same name. We do the same thing and we forget. But the difference is that our groom suffered. Suffered. 
so that we can be married to him. Suffer so that we could be brought in. Now, I know that many of you are marrying, and some of you may feel like you're suffering now as a married couple. I don't believe that. But you didn't have to lose your life. You, didn't, you weren't beaten for your bride. You chose to marry her even though knowing what kind of woman she was, her habits. He chose us. That's what I love about the grace of Messiah. I mean, I, I have a hard time choosing myself someday. We were talking about that during the Torah portion sometimes, right? We look in the mirror and we see that man or that woman and we, we struggle. And we forget, man, that he chose us. The groom chose us. Think about that for a moment. I know we maybe have talked about this a, a few times. But would you think about that? Men, think about this for a moment. If your wife that you are now, or one that's courting, there's a rumor there's a wedding coming up sometime soon, right? But, but think about this. Like, if you knew your wife was an adulterer, come on now. And don't give me that, well, I just love her. No, no wait a minute now. Look back. You may love her now or love him. But think about that. Go back to the day when you were beginning to court your wife and you knew she was an adulteress. You knew she wouldn't be faithful to you. You knew she would abandon the vows that you'll do on your wedding night. Come on, somebody. Would you still have picked her? But that's what Messiah does for us. That's what he did for you. That's what he did for me. And that's what we should do for one another. I'm going to leave that right there. I'm going to come back to that statement here just a little bit. So if he came as God, we said that, then it wouldn't have done any good for us. But he came fully in the flesh, and he came fully God to destroy the works of the flesh, is what Romans is telling us. We must remember the ultimate goal of Torah. The ultimate goal of Torah, the end of Torah, is Yeshua. Jump into 1 John chapter 2, verse 5. Look here. What's it say? But whatever, but whoever keeps his word. This is what I was telling you I was going to allude to. I was going to come back to this. This is so good. Whoever keeps his word, in him the love of Messiah is truly made perfect. Now, wait a minute. Now, now, we just read in the book of Hebrews, right, that it was made perfect through suffering, that Jesus made everything perfect through suffering. Then what in the world can this possibly mean? This is why I told you we'd come back to Torah. Because you are seated as a follower of Christ, as a believer in Messiah and his suffering and his death and resurrection, you're seated with him in the heavenlies. But there's still a life that we have to live here on earth, isn't there? Right? So on this earth, as followers of Christ, how are we made perfect? Now, I'm seated with Christ. But in John, he says, but whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God is truly made perfect. We know that we are in him by this, that we live as Messiah lived. We, we know the rest of the verse. In verse 6, I didn't put it up there. But that's, that's truly so powerful. Because as we said earlier in verse 10, his point is that the Father intended to perfect Jesus by means of suffering. And I find this fascinating because the word perfect in the Greek is the word teledos. And it means complete, to come, or to bring, or to finish. Interesting. I just had this random thought. This is just my brain on Torah. Verse 10, the number 10 means what? Completion. And yet in verse 10 of Hebrews, he says the same thing. He used this word perfect, the word Toledos. And it means in the Hebrew, it means to make complete, 
So we have this conundrum of sorts. Either we're complete in Christ, or the word that we keep, i.e. the Torah, makes us complete. And to that, I would say yes and yes. You and I are complete in Christ, seated with him above. But here on this world, in this planet, we are made complete by how we complete, uh, complete or how we keep his word. And the number one thing that we're supposed to keep is love. Walking in love towards one another. When he states that Yeshua is the author of our salvation, he uses a compound Greek term that means both to rule and to lead. He is our ruler. He's our leader. He's our pioneer. He goes before us. The author of the book of Hebrews points out that Yeshua is our salvation, our author, the pioneer of redemption. This destroys any other faith, any other religion, any other works. It's destroyed. In this, we see three features concerning him as the pioneer of our redemption. I want to go through those relatively quickly. First... He was made perfect through suffering. The word perfect means to reach a goal, to attain, to perfect. His sufferings attained a desired end, a desired goal. What was the desired end? You and I. The means of completing his humanity was by means of his suffering. His humanity was perfected, completed through suffering. What's interesting, it really brings this to light, is another story that I found in the letters or the writings of Arrhenius. And I find it interesting because it really kind of like lights this up, what we're talking about in Hebrew. It just, it just makes it make sense. And, and let, me, let, me, let me show you this. This is really cool. Stephen, teaching these truths when he was yet on earth, saw the glory of God and Jesus on his right hand. And he exclaimed, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. These words he said and was stoned, and thus did he fulfill, watch, the perfect doctrine. Where do we see this at? It's not done. This is great. Copying in every respect the leader of martyrdom. And praying for those who were slaying him. In these words, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Notice the love. They were th- thus were they perfected who knew one and the same God. You can't make this stuff up. That is almost a direct quote from Hebrews. The only way he could have got that is from the book of Hebrews. That's amazing. Stephen sets the example of what Yeshua did for us. And because of that, the people that watch Stephen die, and it's what happens with us. What is that? They were perfected, who knew one and the same God. And I challenge, and, and I push back. Here's, here's what I, surmise to you, I submit to you, is I think their faith was strengthened. That's what was perfected, their faith. And when we think about this for a moment, when we think about Messiah, when we think about what he did, our faith too should be perfected and strengthened. No matter what you may go through, no matter what you may face, we have faith, we have trust, and we're made perfect because of Messiah. This language sounds exactly like the book of Hebrews, which I think is absolutely fascinating. The very fact that Messiah suffered to bring us in should be a moment for each of us It should do what the observers of Stephen did. It perfects our faith. It challenges us. It should rock the core of who we are. In other words, the very fact that we know that Yeshua is the initiator, the captain of our salvation, that he is the only way brought to this perfection should fire us up to live the life we were created to live and better than that, create the life we were commanded to live. That's what I love about how Torah and Messiah, when they collide. Because I don't know about you, and I'm going to be a little transparent. I'm not very good all the time 
at walking out obedience. I'm not very good at it sometimes. Sometimes I get angry. I know it's crazy you guys would think that Pastor Mike would get angry. Oh, I do. Sometimes I get hurt. Sometimes I lose faith. Sometimes, I know none of you have ever experienced this, I find sometimes that I just lose hope. And I find myself kind of wading into sometimes depressive and depression kind of areas, places of just, and you go, Wayne, you shouldn't do that. You're a, you're a Christian. But all of us, at some point in our life, we feel that way. And if you don't, praise the Lord. But then I'm reminded of what happened with Messiah. I'm reminded why he went through what he went through. I'm reminded that he rose from the dead. I'm reminded that he endured everything in human possibility that I could face. He faced it. That's joy. That reminds me to pick myself up, dust myself off, and keep pushing forward. Amen? Keep pushing forward. Galatians chapter 1, again, Paul, he says, Grace to you and peace or shalom from God our Father and our Lord Yeshua the Messiah, who gave himself for our sin to rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God the Father. According to the Father's will. According to the, the Lord's will. I want to say that according to God's plan. Our life is so much better when we just do things according to God's plan and not our own. It says, to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Why? Because he fulfilled Yahweh's plan. That's what we're seeing in the book of Hebrews. He's reminding us. He's reminding us that. Let me get open. I want to open that up. I want to read that there real quick. There we go. For it was fitting for Yahweh, for whom and through whom all things exist, in leading many sons to glory to perfect through suffering the initiator of their salvation according to Yahweh's will, according to Yahweh's plan. Nobody put him up to this. And then what's beautiful about it, that's what I love why he's king, is he willfully gave into it. What's my point? My point is this. There are going to be moments in your life that you're living according to Yahweh and you will suffer. There's no answer sometimes. Sometimes there's nothing clear to give to you and go, well, Why? Why hasn't my daughter been healed? Why did I lose oh, why did I lose my baby? Why did this person die? Why did this person get I don't understand. But we keep pressing in to Yeshua. Because he understands. He understands obeying Yahweh and obeying the Father. Suffering for us so that his will. His will, guys, is accomplished. This is why, this is why I believe, man, it's, this is a somber message. As I was praying, even coming up here, Lord, I said, just, just, I want you to do whatever you want. I want you to speak through me in whatever way you can. And sometimes, man, like we come to Sabbath and it's easy. Sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes we don't have all the answers, but we don't need to have all the answers at times. Sometimes we just need to look to Messiah who suffered. Paul took what Messiah did very seriously. Matter of fact, so much so, his very next statement after what he just said here in Galatians 1, 3 through 5, that according to the will of God and the Father, he even, he like puts all his chips in right here. This is powerful. He says, I am amazed. Why are you amazed? Because of, look, verse 5. Or, I'm sorry, verse 4. 
And he says, I'm amazed that you're so quickly turning away from the one who called you by the grace of Messiah to a different gospel. A different gospel, a different good news is what he's saying. Like you found some special new thing and you think that's better than what Yahweh created and what he did and what he designed? Most of you all know the issue here that we're seeing in in the book of Galatians. It wasn't the Torah. It was that these teachers were coming in and said, well, you're not really in. Yes, you get to come in. That's the gospel. You're free access. But they were saying it wasn't really free. They're saying if you're going to get in, you've got to be circumcised. That's the gospel that they were being told, they were being lied to about. That, oh, yeah, you're still in, but you don't really have all the benefits. Verse 7, not that there is another, but only some who are confusing you and want to distort the good news of Messiah. He's putting all his chips in. God created a plan. He fulfilled that plan in Messiah, and now you're going away from it. Why? But even if we or an angel from heaven should announce any other gospel, any other good news to you other than what we have proclaimed to you, let them be a curse. In other words, if anybody comes to you and thinks there's another special way to come into the faith, Even if an angel presents it to you, let them be a curse, Joseph Smith. Allah, Muhammad, Buddha, any other way. Good works, any other way. There's only one way, guys. We know what the good news is, don't we? Or do we? Do we know what the good news was? Right? Messiah, when he sends out the 70, and he says, go to them and proclaim. Proclaim the good news. What was the good news? The Messiah has come. Messiah has come. Messiah has come. The very thing that the Hebrew church is falling back away from again, that they believed in, Messiah came. He died. He rose again. He will rise again. Amen. Second, he'll bring many sons into glory. That's the second point. Had Messiah not died and suffered, we wouldn't have access. We wouldn't have access. We would still have to die. Think about this. What commandment did you break this week? Don't raise your hand and volunteer that information. Praise God. Okay. Just between you and you. If you want to tell your spouse, they probably already know. Right? Think about that. What commandment did you break? Death. Oh, it wasn't that bad. I told a little tiny lie. Death. Think about it. Like, put this in context. Feel the weight of this. We don't do that sometimes. We forget to weigh it. Maybe somebody offended you. In your heart, you had animosity towards them. Maybe you walk in rebellion a little bit. Maybe you got a little rebellion in your heart, right? Death. Deuteronomy says that rebellion is the sin of witchcraft, and witchcraft not a good thing. There's plenty of things. And you know what I love? If it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what your level is. Well, I didn't do what that person did. Doesn't matter. Yeah, but I just did a little bit. Like, it doesn't matter if you grew up in church and you did everything right and you had the perfect family. Your dad never went to the you know, store and picked up milk and never come back. He stayed there. He was with you. He never beat you. Your mom never ran off. You had the perfect family. Went to church every Sunday or Sabbath. You never stole. You never lied. Never drank alcohol. Got drunk and stupid like some of us have. None of it. The very fact that you were born, your sin is just as great as some of the guys that Jordan and I get to visit with in the penitentiary. I make sure we say visit this time, not stay. Apparently, last time I talked to Jordan and I going to prison, I did preface this. 
That's funny, though. I don't care who you are. We did get to come home. Obviously, we're here. I call Robin every time on the way home. They let me out. But it doesn't matter. This is a good warning for us as a community, isn't it? That every person that walks through that door may not be as perfect as you. May not have the clean path that you may have. But they may be very dirty. And they stink of sin. They may thrive in that place. They may be prodigal sons and daughters. Let us never get to a place in our redeemed life where we believe that our sin somehow is lesser than someone else's. May we never compare. Because there is no comparison. Is there? The only, the only one we get to compare ourselves is to Messiah. And with that comparison, we all will fall short. Now, just to preface this, no one's in here talking about another person or whatever, like, what is he talking about? It's just a statement that I feel like we need to remember. Because when we gather together, one of the things I love about worship is it always takes our eyes off of us and the week and the church and everything and just puts that worship where it belongs, on the king. He died to bring many in and to give many access. We have to remember there's always a penalty of sin. Even now, even now as followers of Messiah, there's still penalties of sin. Sin always, church, if you did not know this, please listen to me today. Sin will always cost you something. Even as a follower, even as someone who's accepted the sacrifice that Messiah gives, there is always There's always, always, always. Sin never, never comes back empty. There's always a cost. I was talking with someone, I don't even remember who it was, but we were talking about kind of how this sin thing works. And, you know, you can have this beautiful pool and this beautiful pond, but have just this little tiny, tiny pebble that represents the sin, right? Just a little thing. Wasn't even a big deal. Nobody even knew. But you take that and you throw it into that pool. And most of you all know this. What happened? The ripple of it. You may not even be able to see all the ripples. But what does it do? It impacts the entire pond. That's what sin does. No matter what you think it is. No matter. And when you give it into it. That's a crazy thing, right? The enemy is such a deceiver. He opens that door and he just says, well, it's just a little thing. It's not a big deal. And you don't feel no guilt of it. You don't feel, yeah, you're right. You know, it's not a big deal. But then that leads to the next thing and to the next thing and to the next thing. And before you know it, man, you're, you're so far away from Messiah, you don't know what happened. Do not let sin crouch at your door. This is why we talk about repentance a lot, teshuvah. This is why we have the, the, you know, you have brothers and sisters. Go to them. Don't just go run to them and confess Let not sin harbor in your life because there is always a penalty. There will always be a cost. Even though you may know the Lord, let us never forget that sin will cost you something. And the thing that really should really weigh us down when sin happens is that Yeshua paid the cost for it. He paid the cost. Not just for me, but for everyone. May we never look at someone again, no matter what they've done, and think that they cannot be saved. Even the people we see, we know that have committed horrendous crimes. No matter what they've done, they can be set free. They can be redeemed. Nobody, listen church, until their last breath until they give up that last breath no one is out of the reach of messiah we were talking about this today i was talking with one of the brothers here today and i'm like i wonder and just this is again one of those things don't answer out loud this is between you and you but when was the last time we really shared the love of messiah with someone outside of church outside of a torah community When was the last time you told somebody about Jesus? 
This is why I'm, I'm preaching this really today, because I know that everybody that I look across the audience, and I don't know who's online, but I know across this, I know most of you, and most of you have a love for Jesus. You love Messiah. But my question then is for you is, like, are we taking that for granted? Let us not become so self-righteous that we forget. We've got to tell somebody, man. I was telling this person, I said, that's why one of my firm beliefs, and y'all get this, kind of who we are as an Epic Life Church, so we do things a little different, we're a little special, um, and that is like theologically, right? I want you to think about it. Theologically, I'm a closed fist guy. I really am. I'm a closed fist guy. Show me in the Bible. Show me scripture. Closed fist, theologically. But evangelically, reaching people as an evangelist that we all should be, I'm very open-handed. In other words, whatever it takes to reach people outside, I had to make sure I clarified this, outside of, you know, anything illegal, unethical, to make sure I put that up, right? Unbiblical. That should be an open hand for us. In every opportunity that we have, if we believe the suffering that occurred that we see in the book of Hebrews, if we believe that suffering, then my question is, listen, think about this. Would you rather that suffering go on to people that you know? Because that's what's in for them. They will take on the suffering that Messiah did. He frees them. He frees us who've received Christ. We don't have to suffer that way or be separated from our Heavenly Father ever. That's love. That's real love. It's why I'm so compelled as a pastor to go to the prisons. Because unbeknownst to many of us, not a lot of people are banging on the front door to get in and talk to these guys. There are a few. That's why we should be going to homeless shelters and loving these people or the homeless that we see out on the street. That's why we should be clothing orphans, taking care of the orphan. That's why we should find them the naked and clothe them, the hungry, and we should feed them. That's ministry. That's why we go to prison. These are the things that Yeshua said when you do these things, you're doing it unto me. And I don't know about you, man, but I know the life that I lived prior to coming to Christ, and I can't help but think of, man, if that person, that one person who came to me and showed love, even though I probably never deserved it, but yet it compelled me to come in and to know the Father. So let's not like just read through the book of Hebrews and kind of skim through it and miss this, this testimony of what was sacrificed to bring us in. Jumping over to Romans chapter 8, verse. Oh, am I still there? Did I not finish that? My bad. Yeah, you started preaching, Mike. I'm sorry, that wasn't in the notes. Verse 10, I am now trying to win people's approval or God's, or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be servant of Messiah. Let's serve Messiah. Let's share the gospel. There we go. Now Romans 8, 15. Here we go. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery <laughs> to fall again into fear. Fear of what? This is, remember, this is dealing with salvation. Like we don't have to fear death. It's the beauty of it, isn't it? You don't have to worry. Remember we said the last thing would be defeat is death, but we don't have to fear death. We don't have to fear death. Why? Because the punishment's been, been taken care of. I don't have to fear death. You don't have to fear death. We have life, and not just any life. We have abundant life, eternal life. Rather, you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Ruach himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of Yahweh. And if children, we are heirs and heirs of Yahweh and joint heirs with the Messiah. 
if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. In other words, as we live, as we do what we're called to do, as we come out of our kind of our, our little groups, people are going to see that we're different. You start talking about Jesus publicly. You start bragging on Jesus. You start sharing the testimony. There is suffering that can occur. There is tribulation that comes with that. And third, the last thing, this was according to God's purpose. For it became him for whom are all things and through whom are all things. It was God's plan. It was God's program for him to be a man and to suffer these things. That's why he becomes our salvation, our author and our leader. So I find the author says exactly what needs to be said, that Yahweh is the initiator. He is the captain, that Yahweh set everything in motion that will bring everyone to his glory. He literally is the glue, the glue that holds everything together. Charles Spurgeon said it this way. When Jesus said, I am the way, he clearly intended to exclude all other ways. So beware, lest you perish in any one of them. If we do not recognize Yeshua or we forget who Yeshua is, may we be on guard. Guard ourselves. Guard our hearts from, re- for, from forgetting. I know I've said this already, but it's worth repeating. That if you can get a non-believing Jew to sit down and read this letter, this is why I love this letter. It would lead him to Messiah. I also want to note something else. Knowing what we know about the Father, is it too hard to conceive that sometimes, maybe even the harder times, when we're going through suffering and the heartaches, although we may not see it at the moment, we were talking, you know, sometimes we go through junk, right? It's easier to step back in the middle of that after we've gone through it, right, and look back at it and go, oh, okay, now I see where Yahweh was working, right? But sometimes we got to remember in the midst of it, just a small reminder, maybe on your mirror, right? And just say, Yeshua suffered. Just remember, suffering is coming. Every person in this room, you are going to face some sort of suffering. Why? Why? Not because you're special, but because of what Yeshua went through. But suffering is going to happen. And in the midst of that suffering, if we could do it now, one of the things I tell people when we're counseling and they're having a difficult in certain situations, I said, okay, let's pre-plan. Let's pre-plan the situation, whatever that situation may be. What happened if? What's the worst that could happen inside that situation? So let's do it again as followers of Christ. You know that tough times are going to come in some point in your life. And you will have opportunities to walk away from the faith. You will have opportunities to cower. You will have opportunities to gossip or bitter or argue or whatever. What happens if in the midst of that, we just remind ourselves what Jesus did? The cost. What it cost. That he was the captain. He was the initiator. He blazed the trail. He did what no one else could possibly do. Not an angel and nor a human being. Suffering will come. Matter of fact, um, Diedrich Bonhoeffer, some of y'all may know who that is. There was a movie just put out by him. It says, suffering is the badge of the true Christian. Now, let me preface this for a moment. If you're suffering because of something you've done, come on, somebody. That's not really suffering. That's called reaping, right? That's reaping. But as a, as a follower of Messiah, especially, I think, in this movement, it's one of the things we talked about uh, on Thursday on Thanksgiving with my family member, because we talked about, like, like, the common church, right? Like, they're everybody's friend. And the world loves them, and the, they love the world, and it's really cool. It's like, oh, my gosh, I'll, you know, but it's when it, I've seen more suffering in Judeo-Christians who've gone back to obedience, even when everybody else is like, no, you ain't got to do that no more. 
Now, I, I know that suffering kind of goes against a lot of modern day theology. And I'm not saying also, let me also preface that it doesn't mean that Yeshua or Yahweh makes you suffer to prove a point. I know that that's a false teaching as well. But I also know that when you begin to live, when we begin to live the way we were called to live, you won't be everybody's friend. And the world will despise you. And you may lose your job because of the Shabbat. You may. You may lose family members because they think you're a heretic because you went back to the word. And living a life according to the word. You live like Jesus lived. There is suffering. I know that some people don't believe that God doesn't want you to suffer. But that goes so against scripture, doesn't it? I mean, think about the suffering that Jesus did for a moment. Think about the crucifixion. I just want us to do that for a moment. I want you to imagine the crucifixion for a moment. Now, for some of you, that may be difficult because you've never seen it. But you have to understand, man, that the crucifixion was a very, very cruel way to die. But before he was even crucified, we have to think about the beating of the cat of nine tails. Right? This leather contraption that there's debate on whether there was glass tied on the end of each leather strap. Or bone, sometimes it was bone that had been sharpened or rocks or stones. And they would tie him down or tie his hands back on a pole or a rock or something. And then a Roman soldier would commence beating him. And they knew that if he beat, if, if you could beat the human up to 40 lashes, it was kind of like the, the all in. That was when it killed him. That's why it says that he, he was beat 39 times, save one. He was, cruci- he was, he was convicted to 40. Save one, 39 of stripes that he received. But even when he gets up, the Roman soldier who abused him literally says, scripturally, he says, the man. Because no other man had been able to survive that. Think about this for a minute. As they whoop this guy, as they whoop Messiah, or whoever the, 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 the convicted was, it would grab or cut, it either grab the skin or it would rip the skin. I think sometimes we forget the cruelty that he endured. Let alone, I was thinking about this the other day, the, 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 uh, the crown of thorns, right? Like, I'm a wuss, okay? If I get a crown, a thorn on my finger, I'm done, okay? I told Robin, I slammed my hand in the door the other day, nice, pretty, purple finger. And I told Robin, I said, that would have killed most men. I said that while I was crying, just about, just tears, like it hurt so bad. So I can't imagine. The other day, my my granddaughter uh, was outside without shoes on. We have a patch around our front that hasn't quite been taken over by good grass yet. And so there's all those those goat spurs, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? And so I'd seen her earlier that day, and I said, hey, don't, she had no shoes on, her and Brent, no shoes. I'm like, what are you guys doing, man? Put some shoes on, go back outside. And she said, well, why, Papa? I said, well, because you're going to be screaming out at Papa to come save you, and you're going to have a foot full of goat spurs. So I take them in, feed them lunch. They go back outside. I'm back in my office working, and what do I hear? Papa, Papa, Papa. It's my little girl uh, crying. I go out there, and where's she at? Standing right in the middle of goat spurs. I lift up her feet. Both feet are covered with those, see, you guys relate to that, right? You got, I mean, like that hurts. Doesn't even compare to the cat of nine tails and what was done to Messiah. But in the crucifixion, there were various methods of performing the execution. Usually, the condemned man, after being whipped or scour, uh, scourged, dragging the cross beam of his cross, he had to take his own cross beam. And there's debate on how big that was. You know, sometimes I know in the movies it shows like this great big railroad tie. And, and we don't know. It could have been, we know it was big. We know it was heavy. We know it was exhausting because it's what happened to Messiah on, uh, on the way up to Golgotha. We know he got exhausted. We know he fell down from exertion. 
Now, the, up, the upright shaft was already fixed in the ground wherever they were going to lead them uh, for punishment. They were stripped of his clothing. Now, that's something we don't think about, but we should for a moment, especially for a Jewish male. That was absolutely a no-go. That was absolutely humiliating, shameful to even do that let alone a rabbi or a teacher. So he was humiliated publicly. He was bound fast with outstretched arms to the cross beam or nailed firmly to it through wrist. Now we know that we believe that he was nailed in either really, it, we, we, it shows the hand, but I believe, and some of y'all can correct me later, the hand can't support that. So literally, it would have been through the two bones that are in your arm. We don't know the size of the spike that went through him. We only know that it happened. The cross beam was then raved high against against the shaft and made fast, held fast to about nine to 12 feet, approximately about three meters from the ground. And next, the feet were tightly bound or nailed. There's physical evidence that we believe that, that it did go through, that they did pierce his feet with the nails. We know that biblically, based off of Thomas' observation. Nailed. A ledge was inserted about halfway up. The upright shaft gave some support to the body. So it was, he was forcing his body upward to contort it, basically. Oh, Lord help me. The ledge that was inserted about halfway up the upright shaft gave some support to the body. Evidence for a similar, a similar ledge for the feet is rare and late. Over the criminal's head was placed a notice stating his name and his crime. But because there was no crime, they simply put king of the Jews in, I believe, three different languages. Death ultimately occurred through a combination of constrained blood circulation organ failure, and asphyxiation as the body strained under its own weight. It could be hastened by the shattering of the legs. That's why they would shatter the legs. It's to end it. A storm was coming. What many believe, the storm that was rocking, really, I believe, it was the wrath of God. And so in haste, they went to break all the legs, but fulfilling prophecy of Messiah... They pierced him with the spear into his lungs. The greatest cry that I hear sometimes when I think about my king and my Lord is Eli, Eli, Thibachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And there's debate on that statement because the debate on the statement, in my opinion, and what I believe, is because he had to feel the weight of sin. And because sin separates, as we alluded to earlier, in that moment, maybe for just that period, and we can debate this later, the humanness of Messiah was, was prevalent. The punishment. Maybe some even say that that it was, like, it was like the father literally turned his back in heaven from his only son. And not because he didn't love the son, but because he did love the son, but he hated the sin that was now upon the back of Messiah. When we think of our faith, we should think of this. Not that we go around doom and gloom because we know the victory. We know the victory is that Messiah rose and defeated the death and the cross. But he did it for me. 
and he did it for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 4 uh, beginning of verse 7, but we have this treasure in jars of clay so that the surpassing greatness of the power may be from Yahweh and not of ourself. We are hard pressed in every way. We're not crushed, perplexed, yet not in despair, persecuted, yet not forsaken, struck down, yet not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Yeshua. See, every time people look at you and they see Jesus, it's representing the death. It represents what Messiah did. Question, was it worth it? I would say and I would hope that Yahweh would say yes and yes and yes. It was so worth it. The power would be from God and not from ourselves. We are hard pressed in every side, yet we're not. We're carrying the body of death of Yeshua so that in the life Yeshua may also be revealed in our mortal bodies. If you needed a reason to follow Torah, that's it. We don't follow Torah to make ourselves be something we're not. It's sanctification. We're made holy because of what Yeshua did on the cross. We stay holy, Kodesh, the sanctification. By living out our life, obedience to life is a way of expressing death on the cross. I don't want to waste it. Let us not waste that. Paul communicates something very important here. And that is simply, it is all about Messiah Yeshua. Even in difficult times of persecution or suffering, we carry in our bodies the way we live in this world, in this earth suit. We're communicating Messiah. I was going to read a couple of passages from Isaiah, but I think we've made the point. I want to jump over to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11, so we can finish out these last couple of verses. For both he who sanctifies, going on in Hebrews 2.11 now, for both he who sanctifies and those being sanctified are all from one. So he is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing praises to you. Do you realize the Messiah is going to testify for you? Come on, somebody. He's going to testify for you. Beautiful passage. It's fantastic. It's awesome because if you're a Hebrew, if you're Jewish, trying to still earn their salvation, and you read that, oh, my lanta. He goes all the way back. He quotes Psalms 22. And what was the Psalms 22 about? Go home and study it. It's about the crucifixion. It's about death. It's about reigning. It's about what Messiah does. It's beautiful. The death of Messiah. And then jumping into verse 13, or like in the midst of the congregation, I'll sing praise. That's just, whew, that just gets me right there in the getter. Look at this. Hebrews 2.13, wrapping up our message today. And again, I will put my trust in him. And here again, he says, here am I, the children God has given me. The sacrifice that was made to bring you and I in. He goes right back again. That's what I love about Hebrews is that it's just, it's, just, it's the Torah. It's the word of God. That's Isaiah 8. This may be why many believers believe that Paul could have been the author of this because some of the statements that are made are absolutely like Pauline statements. It's absolutely phenomenal. And he's doing exactly what Paul did in Galatians. And uh, when he writes, he goes all the way. He pulls, from, he pulls from the Tanakh. And he brings scripture to defend the position. My message is a little shorter today because I knew it was going to be weighty. I love what Jesus has done for us. May we not forget. May we not forget the crucifixion. May that be the hope that we have. Because although, man, we follow Torah, and I don't know anybody in this room that does it 100% right, 
the shadow of death that separates us from the Father. Gone. Because of Messiah. Because of Messiah. Let's pray. Oh, Yahweh. May we be shaken in the core of our faith today as we remember the price that was paid to bring us in. And yet, Lord, you, you testify of those who follow you, those who trust in you, those who have faith in you. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would search our hearts today. And Lord, if there's anything in our life that is unpleasing, if there's areas in our life that we need to repair, maybe with family members or friends, Lord, may we do that today. Such a great, great price for my salvation. Thank you, Father. Thank you that you didn't leave me where I deserve to be kept. But by your grace, Lord, you, you loved me. And you love anyone who comes to you and calls out to you. You love them. You love them that repent. You love them who recognize the death on the cross and choose you over this world, over lawlessness, and over hate versus love. May we be good examples of your light. May we reflect Messiah and his death in the way that we live. In the name of Yeshua. Let's take